and that Senator Rounds and I were both talking about. Thank you. Senator Gillibrand, please. General Cotton, um, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office was created to synchronize the Department of Defense efforts to study and assess unidentified aerial phenomenon. How is STRATCOM li liaising with Aero to help the office do its job? So ma'am, um, formerly UAP, so we are part of that along with other combatant commands. So uh, um, I, I, I have a team as well as uh, myself and uh, in the senior leadership positions um, that liaison with that organization as well as the other COCOM responsible for that, that responsibility. Great. And do you um, foresee that Aero needs additional resources or additional sensors um, or additional detection to be able to um, do their job more thoroughly? I would probably have to defer that to uh, my, my partner in Northcom to be able to answer that question. So I, 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 I don't un um, with what I know, um, I, I don't have a good answer for you in that regard, ma'am. I'll, I'll follow up uh, for the record on that. Um, while Canada has promised to invest $38 billion over the next 20 years in NORAD updates, our radars in the north warning system are pretty old and are in known locations. Can you update us in this setting um, on how you're modernizing our defenses in Alaska and north of our border? So if you're talking NORAD NORTHCOM systems, I'd have to defer to, to NORAD NORTHCOM commander. And then how is STRATCOM adjusting our missile defense capabilities to respond to the threats you mentioned in your opening statement of hypersonic glide vehicles and hypersonic cruise missiles to the extent you can answer that in this setting? Uh, I would prefer if we could, ma'am, in the closed setting to be able to, to address those That's concerns. That's fine. Um, General Dickinson, the Space Force is working on a commercial augmentation space reserve, which would give us a civil reserve space fleet if we needed one during a conflict or a crisis. How is SpaceCom supporting Space Force's efforts to build this reserve? Thank you, Senator. So uh, that is a great initiative. I think it's, uh, we need that. Uh, especially as uh, I described earlier, you know, the, our leveraging commercial industry to uh, augment, provide additional capabilities to us. Uh, the way we're working with them is, as the combatant command and warfighter, we're providing our perspective in terms of requirements for those types of uh, relationships. In other words, we will have the operational piece in terms of what those contractors could, could or could not uh, face uh, in the space domain. So we, we participate in that way. Mm. Um, as we plan for peer-on-peer -peer or near-peer conflicts, we have been able to ensure that our forces know how to use our nation's capabilities and that they have the opportunity to train with those capabilities. But most of our space-based systems are classified as special access programs. At current classification levels, are lower-level commanders able to understand the full scope of capabilities available to the force and able to conduct military planning? with an understanding of space-based capabilities and limitations? So thank you, Senator. So overclassification is a challenge within the, uh, within the department right now, but one that we are aggressively working and looking at refining, uh, if you will, to make sure that we can start bringing systems and capabilities to a lower classification level so that we can optimize their employment as well as training of the operators and the forces that they support. So in other words, the classification, we, we look across those and are revisiting those, uh, those documents, those uh, uh, capabilities to see whether or not we can pull them down to a lower classification level. This also allows us to do more integration, better integration with our allies and partners. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 